Once in a generation, one piece of art so completely, so beautifully deconstructs the horrors of capitalism that we must simply stop and marvel. This generation has the unique privilege, the honour of that piece of art being. Excuse me miss, can I ask you a couple of questions about the 2000 stop motion animated film Chicken Run? So if by some terrible miracle you've not seen this provocative and incisive piece of art, first of all, go watch it, obviously. It's great, you should watch it now. But if you've not watched it and you somehow want to watch this video instead, let me summarise it for you. There are these chickens, right? And they're, they're in prison of a chicken farm, under the boot of cinema's most egregious girl boss. Now these chickens, they don't quite like being imprisoned in a chicken run, having their eggs collected for the profit of the bosses. So these chickens decide to run. The story begins with Ginger, an organic intellectual in the Grampian sense, leading various attempts to escape from the uh, yoke of oppression. <laughs> Crucially, never leaving another chicken behind, despite the fact that it would be really easy for her to escape on her own. The themes of collective resistance versus individual emancipation are established early on here. After several escape attempts, a mixture of despair and, perhaps more worryingly, perhaps even worse, a sense of acceptance begins to spread in among the chickens as they're beset by failure. So laying eggs all your life and then getting plucked, stuffed and roasted is good enough for you, is it? It's a living. And as our hero stands out, looking to the sky, despairing, she sees, flying above her, a cock, who soon crashes into a weather vane and uh, falls into the prison, breaking his wing. I wonder if the weather vane is symbolic of, of Rocky and his sort of changing direction throughout the film. Perhaps. Meanwhile, over the carcass of one of their consumed labourers, the avatars of capital ponder their domain. One paranoid about the workers becoming organised, and the other consumed by capital herself. The need for growth, the quest for profit. I'm sick and tired of making minuscule profits. By the way, the scene where uh, one of the chickens gets taken to the chop uh, is haunting. J used to make me cry as a child. Uh, truly just a haunting, haunting scene. Um, but anyway, finally, the solution to all of Capital's problems reveal itself. Automation. The mass cannibalization of the bodies of the workforce. But the elation of Mrs. Tweedy is interrupted by the foreshadowing of her eventual demise. Oh yes, those chickens are up to summit. Foreshadowing that is at once dismissed, perhaps indicating the short-sightedness of capital itself. It's all in your head, Mr. Tweedy. Say it. It's all in my head. It's all in my head. <laughs> The chickens are getting organised. Upon seeing Rocky's feats and helping him hide from the circus from which he escaped, because truly, Rocky is a clown, ah! the chickens formulate a plan to have Rocky teach them how to fly. But as the lessons continue, doubt begins to creep into the minds of some of the chickens, with one of them being worried that chickens simply don't have access to the right thrust, thrust. and Ginger becoming concerned with the lack of progress being made. We're making progress. Really? I can't help feeling we're going round in circles. While Rocky spends a lot of time getting back rubs and uh, making sure that he's the one in charge, making himself comfortable. Ah! A clown. He's a clown. I fucking hate Rocky. Ah! In the shadow of these concerns comes a turning point in the film. Mrs. Tweedy bursts into the chicken run, gets them all lined up, disciplined in the Foucauldian sense, like a workforce. Again, capital is a prison. 
and it is revealed that one of the chickens hasn't laid any eggs this month. And this is eggs are no longer the product. My life flashed before my eyes. It was really boring. After measuring up Edwina, Mrs. Tweedy doubles the, the food rations. Double their food rations, Mr. Tweedy. I want them all as fat as this one. Ginger, however, isn't bought off as easily as the other chickens. She sees what's happening. She sees the ruling class trying to buy off the chickens with feet, trying to fatten up their bodies for, for the chop, for the pie-making machine. Ginger reveals that they're going to kill all of the chickens. They're fattening us up. They're going to kill us all. Hope dies and pessimism takes its place. Recognising though, in a rare moment of selflessness, of, of kindness, and a moment of change in Rocky, I think, ah! he recognises that the hens need more than just plans to escape, but lives as well. Rocky does something selfless for once and organises a party. I don't necessarily have that much to say about this scene, except that I love it. Look at these rats. Look at them dance. This is great. This is just great stuff. It's a great stuff. It's easy to easy to remit, to like forget that not only is this a great piece of, of art, but it's just a fucking charming film and I love it. Crucially though, it emerges that Rocky's arm has healed and he'll be able to give a flight demonstration in the morning. But the levity is cut short as the pie making machine that Mrs. Tweedy has bought has been switched on for the first time. And Mr. Tweedy, recognising the role of Ginger in the proletariat, collects her first as the victim of the machine. How does it work? Get me a chicken and I'll show you. And I'm just the one. Rocky, seeing how dangerous this is and caring about the well-being of Ginger, launches a daring escape and both of them rage against the machine. Rocky and Ginger escape, they break the machine, um, but crucially they don't break all the systems of control that allowed the machine to be constructed in the first place, and uh, Mr. Tweedy will have to go on to fix it, buying themselves time, but not overturning the, the whole system, not escaping the prison of the chicken farm and the prison of capitalism itself. The next day though, as the chickens excitedly await their flight lesson, it's revealed that Rocky has left in the night, leaving evidence that he is, of course, a fraud. He's escaped on his own as a lone free ranger. Ah! And as despair once again sets in, the proletariat turns on itself. <laughs> Blaming each other instead of the systems. Blaming each other instead of blaming Rocky, who'd lied to them the whole time offered a, a myth of freedom based on his own sort of individualism. But as is always the case, a blink of hope remains as lightning strikes Ginger and she has a new idea. Something that can only be achieved not through following the dictates of a single indivi individualistic fraud, ah! but together as revolutionary subjects. They're going to fly out, but they're not going to do it one by one on their own, they're going to do it together by building the revolution together and building a giant bird that's pedal operated and flies. That's, again, it's great. And so against footage of Mr. Tweedy fixing his machine of death, the chickens steal the master's tools and start building the, their own means of emancipation, their own means of life. Life and death contrasted in these all, uh, hegemonic and subaltern processes of revolutionary versus death-making machinery. True, it's dialectic. It's a dialectic. <laughs> but tragedy strikes, the pie machine is fixed, and Mr. Tweedy discovers the chickens working. This is it. The moment upon which days, months, years of organising and strategising rest. The chickens revolt. <laughs> they incapacitate Mr. Tweedy and start on their escape but are thwarted on the last second by Mrs. Tweedy. And just as all hope looks lost, Rocky returns not as a saviour, 
But as a comrade, he and Ginger knock over Mrs. Tweedy and get the ramp up and the chickens start flying to freedom after one last confrontation with Mrs. Tweedy holding on to the back of the flying machine. The chickens escape. They establish their new home in which all are free to pursue their passions and collaboratively raise their children. Sometimes the grass is just as green as you thought it would be. Would you say you're more of a ginger or a babs? More of a bunty, fair enough, fair enough. So much has been said on how Chicken Run acts as a pastiche of wartime films like The Great Escape, but I think the analysis at that level is missing something. It's missing how the, the setting of Chicken Run, in a Chicken Run, acts as a deep critique of discipline uh, within capitalism, one which Foucault would lose his shit at. Yeah, just out of, I didn't even realise until just there that this was just with an arm shot. Chicken Run is just this. Ginger could, from Chicken Run could write Discipline and Punish, but Foucault couldn't write Chicken Run. That's how that joke format works. <laughs> the stage is immediately set in the opening as the visage of the prison in which the chickens or labourers are interned. Is the prison merely physical or, as Foucault and many others have come to understand, does the logic of the prison worm its way into the very subjects of society? A question we may yet be left to ponder. You know what the problem is? The fences aren't just round the farm, they're up here, in your heads. Due to a role as the Gramscian organic intellectual precipitating resistance, Ginger is frequently imprisoned. Her crime fighting for liberation. No chicken escapes from Tweedy's farm. And thus, Chicken Run makes an incisive critique of the role of the carceral system, of the police, as tools not of enacting some sort of justice, but of exerting discipline and control over those not willing to be crushed. Moreover, and somewhat depressingly, the concept of being prisoned, uh, warehoused away from the pressures of society, is compared to a holiday. Back from holiday? I wasn't on holiday, Babs. I was in solitary confinement. Oh, it's nice to get a bit of time to yourself, isn't it? In this way, Chicken Run is very much like Squid Game, um, in which the world of this murderous game is considered preferable to the outside world. Also, Babs is fantastic. 10 out of 10 character, no notes, lover, 100%, great, lover. So while a liberal might look at this and see merely a, a satire of a prison camp like The Great Escape, we as socialists can see this as a mode of disciplining the workforce, making sure they know the boss is always watching. And yet the prison setting would be incomplete without the spectre of death hanging over it. So in this scene, which haunted my childhood and still haunts me to this day, the chicken who can no longer be productive, whose labour is no longer uh, producing value for the boss, is literally murdered and her flesh and body consumed by capital. Necropolitics is embodied by Edwina. You know, people make a lot about the gothic metaphors in Marx, but here in Chicken Run is the body and flesh of a labourer who can produce no more value, uh, is literally, she's literally consumed by capital. The prison of capitalism rests on necropolitics. And as has been indicated, there is a constant battle against acceptance into this regime of the capitalist prison. In a scene in which the chickens push back on the escape plans and the escape attempts, arguing that chickens should just spend more time laying and less time escaping. It's revealed that, in some sense, the chickens believe that this is all their life could be. That if they step out the bounds of capitalist accumulation, that they somehow deserve death, somehow deserve the punishment that awaits them. We haven't tried not trying to escape. How many more empty nests will it take? Well, perhaps it wouldn't be empty if she'd spent more time laying and less time escaping. The logic has wound its way into their heads. It's started producing particular subjectivities within the, the, within the chickens. 
life can't get better. Note, for example, the necropolitic undertones here, which will soon become overtones. So laying eggs all your life and then getting plucked, stuffed and roasted is good enough for you, is it? It's a living. As the chickens are kept in a place of slow death, they're reduced to economic units which, once they're no longer productive, are deemed useless and murdered. And most horrifically, it's seen as a simple fact of life. Natural. This is, it's a living. In Chicken Run, the prison is capitalism, and capitalism is a prison which reaches deep into the minds of all of the chickens. Do you think the film would have been improved with some more developed feminist themes? Mm -hmm. Interesting. One of the absolute strongest points of this beautiful work of art, uh, beyond the point here, but the form of claymation and the work put into producing this film is like astronomical and it makes it all of more of an achievement. Um, but that's just a side note. Um, one of the strongest parts of this, of this work of art is the strength of each character and the symbolic role that they play within the film. First, let's consider Ginger and Rocky, and we'll consider them together uh, 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 as dialectics. Because, <laughs> like my friend says, dialectics necessarily involves two things. That's what it means. Two things. Ginger and Rocky aren't simply the protagonists or romantic interests of one another, but are symbolic opposites of emancipatory freedom. They, they represent different types of freedom. Ginger, as mentioned, could have easily escaped the chicken run, and yet never, never leaves another chicken behind. As a Randian protagonist from such lesser filmmakers as like Zack Snyder might, probably would. If this was a Zack Snyder film, you know, Ginger would have escaped on her own and then beat people up, but she, she's a revolutionary. She does it together with, with the community. Her goal is the emancipation of all of her people, and she utilises the skills and ideas of those around her as well. Mac, you'll handle the engineering. Babs, manufacturing. Fowler will be chief aviation advisor. Bunty, eggs. She's a leader, but her leadership is focused on the cooperation and the freeing of all of her comrades. Rocky, the big fucking clown by contrast, ah! represents the intellectual and revolutionary cul-de-sac of liberal individual freedom. It is absolutely no coincidence in my mind that he's played by an American and calls himself a lone free ranger. You know what they call me back home? You're going to The lone free ranger. The fraud of liberal freedom is wearing the skin of an American. Obviously. Rather than Ginger's vision of freedom, as the chickens living together with no owners, no farmers, no masters, as a community. Who feeds us? We feed ourselves. Well, where's the farm? There is no farm. Where does the farmer live? He isn't anywhere. Don't you get it? Rocky sees freedom as just him on his own, an island, the liberal ideal of the atomized man. Chicken. His refusal to help is defined by his love of the open road. You can teach us. No, I can't. Listen, shh, you hear that? That's the open road calling my name, and I was born to answer that call. The limits of his imagination are the individual, not bringing down the system. It's not so hard to get one chicken out of it, or, or, or even two, but this is about all of us. All of you? And it's only through fear and being returned to the circus that Rocky finally agrees to help. The lone free ranger versus Ginger's liberation. This is great storytelling. And even as he helps under the fear of being sent back to the circus, the way he helps and the way he understands uh, teamwork and collaboration is extremely individualistic. Now the most important thing is we have to work as a team, which means you do everything I tell you. It, it's it's so liberal. He's such a liberal. It's, it's incredible. How do people not see how fucking revolutionary this film is when Rocky and all of his flaws are the flaws of liberals and liberalism? It's fucking brilliant. Ah! 
And does this not invoke the ways in which liberals will implant themselves in the struggles of others and demand that they follow, uh, follow the edicts of the liberal? Are we not revealing something about the nature of the US as a particular geopolitical power and demanding that people fight for their uh, liberation in ways that are palatable to, to the liberal? This is pointed critique. And the ultimate, the sort of culmination of the fraud of the liberal uh, is revealed as Rocky, out of fear, out of shame, uh, out of being revealed as a fraud, it leaves the chickens to fend for themselves for the sake of his own individual freedom. And he's symbolically imbued here with liberal ideology. The despair of this revolution causes the proletariat to fall to infighting. And it's no coincidence that Fowler describes this as divide and conquer. This is what liberal individualism does. Blame is shifted no longer to the system, no longer to the, the prison of capitalism which, in which they live, the necropolitical death zone to which they are inflicted, but to each other, to their friends, to their community. This is liberal individualism manifest. Gentlemen, this is Democracy Manifest. Only once Ginger, like the prototypical Gramscian and organic intellectual, rises up with a new cooperative revolutionary methods are the chickens again brought together as a revolutionary class. The, the interplay between Rocky and Ginger really is the sort of negation of liberalism as, as an ideal. The idea that, that it has anything useful to give or to say about the world is completely rejected by Chicken Run, by Ginger. And yet, what I will say about Rocky is his flaws aren't pathological. We see him care. We see his care grow for the chickens and he lives among them, living their struggle. And though he rejects emancipation at first, leaving through shame, his return is a refutation of that liberal individualism. He returns to help the movement, not himself. He's already free. He can already make his way into the world as his lone free ranger. He risks, in the end, being stuck in the chicken run. In my mind, Ro uh, Rocky believes that he, he might not survive going back. He's just giving up himself for the movement. That liberal ind individualism is ultimately rejected by Rocky and by the film. The next characters worth, worth discussing um, worth to be considered are Mr. and Mrs. Tweedy, because both of these characters say something very interesting indeed. The characterization of Mrs. Tweedy in particular uh, can be clearly read, very clearly read, uh, almost incredibly clearly read as a critique of the neoliberal feminist ideal. While the first villain of the film to be revealed is Mr. Tweedy and his dogs, acting as kind of like the police, the disciplinary force of, of, the, of the farm. As Ginger is running away from, from the dogs and from Mr. Tweedy, he revealed the subversive ultimate film of Chicken Run is not the dim-witted middle manager Mr. Tweedy and his police dogs, but his wife, the archetypal neoliberal capitalist ideal of womanhood, Mrs. Tweedy. She's ready to exploit the labour both productive and reproductive of her female labourers. The chickens. Throughout this film, Mrs. Tweedy blurs the lines between family and business, resenting the minuscule profits that this family farm has brought in and disparaging Mr. Tweedy for seeing any value in the family farm that's been, been in his family for generations uh, beyond its capacity to make profit. We've always been egg farmers. My father and his father. Poor, worthless, nothings. And here again we can see the critique of neoliberal feminism as Mrs. Tweedy invokes running the family like a business. The familiar, familial relationship is instrumentalised as a labour relation and the family reframed as a business. And moreover, this is done in a way which deeply reifies the social reproductive role of women under capitalism. Mrs. Twinkie's homemade chicken pies. Mrs. Woman's touch makes the public feel more comfortable. Mrs. Tweedy's homemade pies uh, is propaganda to support the idea that it is desirable for pies to be made by a kindly mother figure, while in actuality uh, they're 
the result of deeply destructive production for, uh, forces and cannibalizing the bodies of the workforce, particularly the bodies of um, women or chickens, female chickens, hens. So you know, when I've been I, I, when I was writing this, um, much of this is pretty tongue in cheek. I genuinely think Mrs. Tweedy is a fucking fantastic uh, illustration of the neoliberal sort of feminist and the, a critique of that kind of uh, neoliberal feminist. Like the the the, <laughs> the critiques are so clear and the imagery is kind of fucking incredible. Uh, and there's there's a moment at the end it's where it's made incredibly explicit. This sort of critique of neoliberal feminism is incredibly explicit when in the final showdown on the back of the of the the big flying chicken, um, the ideal of Miss of Mrs. Tweedy uh, is plastered over her face as she's dragged up a billboard. She's like wearing a mask of like the idealized um, mother figure for neoliberal feminism. Um, and she tears off this this mask of um, idealized womanhood under capitalism to reveal a grimacing face of of anger of murder as she tries to chop the head off uh, her her female uh, underling. Um, I genuinely can't think of many more effective symbolic illustrations of neoliberal feminism than this one image of a woman tearing off her idealized mask while trying to murder another femme individual. It's like she's trying to exploit them to death. It's <laughs> genuinely kind of amazing. So the final figure that I think we can give some, um, some look at is Fowler. At first, Fowler's appearance in this film can seem a bit odd. Uh, in a film otherwise packed with metaphors about and, and revolutionary ideas, Fowler seems like an odd addition. Um, they are primarily for the spoof of the Great Escape and War movies. But in his prescient advice to Ginger, warning her about Rocky. Beware of that one, young Ginger. That yank is not to be trusted. Ah! We're reminded that, despite seeming useless, superfluous even, the wisdom of older members of the community can truly cut deep. And, and he is, of course, right not to trust the liberal individual cockiness of, of Rocky, as, as we've been over in some depth. Fowler reminds us that value doesn't exist merely in those that produce profit, but in everyone, especially in those older members of society or so, who are so um, easily cast aside by capitalist systems of value. And on top of this, in a situation where the female characters of this movie hold the burden of productive rather than socially reproductive labour, we might miss that maybe that is part of Fowler's role, to ensure the reproduction of the chicken's labour power through the production of order within the farm and, and the doling out of wisdom and education to the chickens, ensuring that they are awake for work, uh, ensuring that they know how everything works and how, how, how life runs in, in the farm. Sure, he's comic relief, but his value to the revolutionary critique of this film, when properly uncovered, is quite deep. It has true depth. And this idea is more firmly uh, supported in the final scenes of the film when uh, the first, the opening of our, of our post-capitalist utopia uh, starts with Fowler teaching young chicks. He's directly engaging with that social reproductive role. It, it all fits. It, it all fits together. It's great. I also just want to mention the rats because they're great and this is one of my favourite lines. Well, we slipped into the farmer's room, all quiet like. Like a fish. Yeah, and we... Like a fish. I have nothing to say about them. They're just fucking great. Are you worried about the sequel? Because I know I am. Let's check it. This is it's close to a perfect film. How can they improve on it? Mm. Mm -hmm. Finally, let's discuss some of the other metaphor and imagery present in this work of art. 
So throughout this film, we're given visions of a brighter and a better future interspersed with uh, suspiciously communist looking designs. Uh, the poster of the sun rising. Hell, even the titles are red. It'd be easy to brush this off if the context of the rest of the film wasn't so uh, obviously communist. But it is, and so clearly these are deliberate uses of communist imagery. Secondly, I want to draw attention to the great machine that Rocky and Ginger fight. Automation isn't the only critique being levelled here, and in fact, with uh, the arrival of full-scale automated production, full-scale automated production, which will deepen the e exploitation of the chickens to the point of being fully eaten by the machine of capital, Walter Rodney might find relevance. As Mrs Tweedy argues, farming chickens belongs in the dark ages. This will take Tweedy's farm out of the dark ages. Poverty equals worthlessness. Again, the neoliberal feminism of Mrs Tweedy on full display here. Progress must be made. And yet, she's willing to decimate populations of chickens. Whole populations just for profit. Economic development here is as Rodney argues in chapter 1 of how Europe underdevelops Africa, not concomitant with any sort of moral development. In fact, here, and in the case of colonialism, the opposite is in fact true. And it's also, I think, worth pointing out how um, linear and stagist Mrs Tweedy's idea of progress is. This will take Tweedy's farm out of the Dark Ages and into full-scale automated production. <laughs> Automation must mean progress to her. The Dark Ages is something to be escaped, something horrible necessarily, and progress is mass murder. And moreover, while Ginger and Rocky reject the system both symbolically and literally break the machine, unless all the systems that subjugate the masses are torn down, then the machine will always return, and it indeed does. Revolution requires more than just breaking down one part of the system, but in transcending it all, breaking it all down, and building something new in its place. It's then such a victory, both symbolically and literally, as in the end, not only the machine is destroyed, but the farm itself is destroyed. <laughs> and the chickens transcend it and fly off to a new world to build their own community. I think it's also quite symbolic that the machine that the chickens use to fly away is powered collectively. Ginger doesn't take a leading role within the machine. That role is perhaps given to Fowler. He's, he's sort of the pilot, but he doesn't necessarily take it as like a leadership position. But the machine is powered by the effort of the masses, even as they're weighed down by the bourgeois desperate to stop them. No one person is responsible for escaping the farm, escaping the prison, escaping capitalism. It's the result of collective effort, of collective resistance. And finally, as a departing nod to the radical content of this film, we are treated to a discussion of dialectics from the rats. If you don't have a chicken, where are you going to get an egg? Having the chicken, that comes from the egg. In discussing the chicken and the egg, we get a view of dialectics where the presupposition of the egg becomes the effect of that presupposition coming to fruition, i.e. the chicken which then lays the egg. As a friend of mine might say, dialectics necessarily involves two things. And it can be of, in no way coincidental that in a piece so laden with anti-capitalist themes and messaging and imagery that the final lines follow a dialectic like this. Truly a work of art. There's so much more I can say about this truly fantastic film. I could talk about the score which slaps, uh, the form which slaps, the voice acting, which fucking slaps. Uh, I could talk about the, how the whole revolution is predicated on months of organising, uh, or how class solidarity among the chickens uh, isn't just fostered through their position, but through their praxis. Or I could just talk about how fucking funny this movie is, and how charming it is, and how great it is, and how much I love it. Alas, I can't talk forever, so I will just leave you with a call to action to, again, just watch this perfect 
piece of communist art. Just watch Chicken Run. Thanks to uh, all patrons for getting me to 100 or 50. Oh, fuck, it was supposed to be 50 in which I did this. 100 is the next goal that I'm late for. Um, I hope you all enjoy this uh, weird video um, that will be up for everyone else in December. Cheers. Well, ladies, thank you for your time. As ever, I appreciate it so much.